thank the Lord for an opportunity to give him praise and glory this evening and to enter into a time of studying of his word and understanding of his word. <clears throat> we certainly are glad to be able to come together as a body of born again, blood washed believers. I hope that you find the time that we come together a time of encouragement and a time of support and um, we need that today. I cannot speak for anyone else but myself. I need to be encouraged. I need to feel support mm -hmm. yeah. as I shared with uh, Pastor Freeman a couple, a couple days ago. Keep praying for Sister Freeman. <clears throat> Keep praying for uh, Susie Long as well and several, several others that have reached out and solicited prayer. But as I spoke with him uh, a couple of days ago, I said, you know, the Lord the scripture says what Moses said to the people as he was some of his parting words uh, to admonish them that the Lord comes to our help in the clouds and he rides to our help on, on the heavens. But then it says, you know, we have to look up for that. But then, it, then the scripture says, but underneath of us are his everlasting arms. Amen. So it's good to know that. Yet, in the meantime, it's good to have the arms of your fellow uh, co-laborers and, yeah. and fellow Christians, disciples in Christ, around you and supporting you. Amen. Um, the Lord's arms are certainly more than enough, but it's always good to see, as, as, as used to say in Bible study, there's other fellows in the ship with you. Amen. If you are in fellowship here tonight with first the Holy Spirit and then with your brother, say amen. 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 So we give God the glory. Acts the sixth chapter. Praise the name of the Lord. Father, we stretch our hands to you tonight. No other help we know. If you would withdraw yourself from us, oh, whither shall we go? We need you, we need you, we need you to help us, to guide us, to lead us. There is none like you, and we declare that you are the only true and sovereign and living God. Amen. Bless now this Bible study and every heart that will hear, <clears throat> every heart that will listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I think last time we were here, <coughs> we had, if I remember correctly, we had a good time, didn't we? Amen. Amen. We want you to be mindful that uh, we have been asked to stand yet again in the gap and uh, declare God's truth uh, between the living and the dead. And uh, Brother Thomas Westbrook has gone on from his labor to his reward. It was just a few weeks ago he was coming to Bible study. And he was, was happy and, and was learning and I would see him asking questions and um, we had just gotten him a Bible so pray for his family in Jesus name pray for them in a mighty way pray for our church that is called yet again to serve and to minister in some capacity that someone may see Christ um, I don't know why the Lord allows these things but I just simply know that he's sovereign and he will have his way we need to be ready to be uh, a servant amen Amen. So I praise God for you all who labor and, and work along with the ministry of this <laughs> church. We're going to kind of get into that tonight. Amen. Chapter 6. <clears throat> We're not going to take many verses, and this may not last too long. So uh, we will uh, pick up on Stephen next week, and it will be a lengthy amount of verses for him, but we're going to try to condense that down but tonight we're just going to deal with verses one through seven so if y'all pray with me for just a little while uh, we will see what the lord says about choosing co-laborers 
choosing co-laborers. This text is many times a text that is used um, when we start to describe the origin of the office of deacon. The origin of the office of deacon. Um, <clears throat> we have been studying uh, in my fifth grade secular class uh, talking about a big word, etymology. <clears throat> etymology is the study of the origin of words. And we have been studying Greek and Latin science roots. Well, uh, in the original language here, we're going to find a word tonight that is used as servant, diakonos, which we get our English word deacon from, or one who, who serves through the dust, one who, as he serves, uh, whips up dust. <laughs> And uh, they didn't say they were dusty, Sister Close, amen, but this serves through, <laughs> through the dust. Amen. I got to see y'all laugh behind those masks tonight, yeah. amen. We love our deacons here, and we praise God for them. So let's read, and this is from the King James. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Amen. So we see here in Acts, the sixth chapter, and I know I have uh, verses 1 through 15, but we're just going to stop at 7 tonight. Um, Acts, the 6th chapter, verses 1 through 7. We see here that this is on the heels of what happened uh, <clears throat> with uh, Ananias and Sapphira, what happened with the, the disciples all being brought before the court, uh, what had happened, uh, as Gamaliel said, if this movement or this, this thing that is happening is of God, it will last. But if it is of man, it will fade. And he was speaking what he considered probably, I would say, earthly wisdom. But it was certainly of heavenly meaning that God used it. And so here we come uh, out of the fact that they had uh, uh, experienced, uh, I guess, opposition from the outside. Now we are looking at something that is happening on the inside of the church. Amen. And that's a, good, that's a great point that we need to consider tonight. The church will face trials and tribulations from the outside. But I would venture to say that many times the ones that can be the most trying are the ones that happen from the inside. Amen. Amen. Uh, the, the, the opposition, and especially you'll see this with the early church, but the ones that are, are, are most trying can be the ones that happen from the inside. So as you read verse 1, this is with the understanding that thousands upon thousands are being added to the church. People are getting saved. They are hearing the word. They are uh, being saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. They are being baptized. They are partaking of the Lord's Supper. Um, and they are carrying out those things that 
have been mentioned in Acts the, the second chapter. Turn back there quickly. Acts the second chapter and beginning at verse 44. And it says, all that believed were what? Together. And they had all things in common. They had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now keep in mind, when Pentecost happened, remember there were people who had come from far away and were there for the Passover, yet uh, when, when the Holy Ghost came and the, the proceedings of what happened at Pentecost and people were saved and delivered and, and God began to bless the church, some of those people did not leave and go back home. Some did stay. Now, yet some did go and carried the gospel with them, and that's how the gospel spread. But some did stay, and the church was growing. And look at verse 46 of chapter 2. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Amen. They went from different folks' houses and ate. Uh-huh. And we, we won't do that today, but we, we come into the house to eat uh, we are fed here at church, but in that particular time, they went from house to house and, and supported one another. That, that would be a wonderful sermon. We're coming to your house to eat. Amen. Did they eat their meat with what? Gladness, and catch this, singleness of heart. That, that, that's, that's a theme throughout Acts. They were of one accord. They had singleness of heart. They were unified. Then it says, because of that, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. Amen. So it, it is a wonderful problem that happens. All these thousands of people are coming to the Lord. Thousands of converts. We can't even begin to imagine that. We are excited today if one person comes and one person sticks. Amen. I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited when I look out there and I see some people that came and the Lord touched their hearts and, and they experienced the, 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 the life-altering word of God and they have a relationship and they're sticking. Realize there's some who come and don't. And they're here for a while and then you don't see them anymore. And that is from not just this church, but that is happening. that happens from church to church and in the church. So things were exploding uh, with numbers, and the gospel had ignited the whole area. So you all know that the basis for this whole book is Acts 1 and 8. So it was literally going from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the, uh, to the utter, other most parts of the world. So the witnesses were doing their job. So in a way, you could say that these numbers were, in a sense, a good problem. I got to thinking about that, and I was thinking just something that came to my mind that happened maybe five, six years ago, seven years ago or so, maybe even a little bit before that, that one year we had a team, and you know, we would go out with football and recruit these. I was sitting there thinking about that. I was watching little kids play bitty ball last night. That, that was, that was a, a wonder, fun game to watch, and those guys are standing out there and I told Stephanie, the kids still, they still the same. When some of them are standing on the sidelines and they'll look up at one another and they have to look up under the, the face mask to see. And they pat each other on the shoulder pads, hit them real hard to let them know, hey, I'm standing here, I'm playing football with you. And they're looking, trying to see. And you know, it's nothing like going to those little guys' games. That's the biggest thing for them. Yep, one year we were coaching and we had over 30 kids on a team. We had almost 33, 34 kids. And we were finding it problematic to stay competitive, but also make sure everybody got to play. So in a sense, it was wonderful to have the numbers because then you could run a full practice. You didn't have to do half a line against another half a line. You had numbers and it was great. But then the numbers could become problematic when somebody started to murmur, why didn't my kid get as much time as number Amen. But then if you lose, then folks are arguing with you about that. If you win, but you don't have enough folks that got to play, people 
people are mad about that. So I began to see, and I already knew it, it doesn't matter what you do, folks are going to murmur. Amen. <laughs> amen. amen. And if it's that way with football, then go on and say amen. It can be that way in the church. Amen. So numbers can also cause more issues. All right. And I wrote this down. I'm, I'm always, I try to be very candid with you all. As I started here with this ministry, I misstepped in, in, in kind of a way. I, I would get concerned when there weren't the numbers that were there the week before or the week before that. That's just an honest, honest, I guess, young pastor, immature in some ways, looking at that. I had to realize that it, it is not a focus on numbers, but a focus on quality and efficiency. Amen. That banner out there could, had become a distraction. If it said 99 one week and then 69 another week, then I was sitting somewhere trying to feel all melancholy and bad and all these things. And the Lord had to arrest my attention and say, that is not why you are here. You're here to take whatever numbers come and work on them and help them to be quality Christians. Quality disciples. So numbers have their place Yet, sometimes they can cause issues. So here, here is the issue. Let's break it down. It is a, a, a Jesus had a small group. You see that there? So that you could see that numbers weren't always the big thing. And even when there were thousands, remember what he did with the uh, uh, five loaves and the two fish? He seated them in companies, in smaller groups. All right? But here we see an issue with the human factor. Amen. Y'all know that humans going to be a mess irregardless. You know anybody like that? Don't look. Don't look. Don't look. Don't think. Just say amen. Amen. So numbers are great until people begin to murmur. Now that word in the, the language uh, uh, murmuring in, in verse 1, it simply means to have a secret debate. Or a displeasure that is not publicly avowed. It, it is similar to, you can say, uh, like something that bubbles below the surface. If you're looking above the surface, you can't see anything. But underneath the surface, there can be undertoes and, and currents and bubbling. If you think of it in terms of a volcano, and there's been a big volcano erupting, I'm quite sure that scientists can tell sometimes that something's about to blow even before the red lava comes out of it, they can see that there's trouble under the surface. Amen. So there was trouble under the surface because of the human factor. Two cultural groups, they were both uh, uh, Jewish, so to speak, uh, uh, Christians, yet one was a Jewish Christians that that were Greek speaking, and the other were those who were of the area, the Aramaic uh, speaking Christians uh, that were Jewish. And so it's probably to, due to the fact that some of them had come, like I said earlier, and they had not left there. They had come from Asia Minor, and they were they stayed in the area where they were. All right. So there's nothing against that. Let, let's understand that. Help me, help me, Holy Spirit. There's nothing wrong with having different cultural groups in your church as long as they're under the banner of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's nothing wrong. There is nothing out there. Nothing out there that says this has to be just a black church. Amen. There's nothing out there that says we have to be just a white church. Lord, help us. And there are those that will try to divide and to to separate and try to stereotype and, and, and make all these different things. We even try to put it on a hoodie so y'all can wear it around and remember what we're about. Amen. And it said, not here. Amen. You may be somewhere else, but it's not going to be here. And I still stand on that. It is not about black and white and rich and poor. It's about are you washed in the blood? Amen. Amen. But in the church, there begin to be uh, internal uh, rumblings, murmurings below the surface. And here, here's how it broke down. The Hellenistic uh, uh, Jews were upset 
with the uh, Aramaic speaking Jewish Christians or the Jewish Christians of the area because their widows seem to be overlooked in the daily ministration of goods. All right? So what does that mean? Basically, if I may put it in Christian vernacular, Christian commentary, amen, that's Christian Scott, by the way, commentary, praise the Lord, they was upset because somebody got more food than somebody else did. Did that come down your aisle? Did you catch that? Somebody received a little bit more food, so they thought, than somebody else did. So as they were, were giving out food to those who needed it, it seems as if it says they were neglected in the daily ministrations. All right? So now, we know that all of us, and you go back to your childhood. Now, I'll give you a wonderful example. I grew up on third. I loved my childhood. I grew up with a lot of good friends around me, but there was sometimes some of those friends weren't quite fair. And there were times probably when I wasn't quite fair. And we would get a candy bar. It was a big thing to have a candy bar. Am I talking about anybody's generation in here now? It was a big thing. And you would hear them say, I'll half it with you. Y'all heard me say this. Come on, Minister Griffin. I'll half it with you. And then you watch the cutting of the halves. <laughs> or you get something to drink. Come on, come on. And, and say, let me have first drink. And they drink. And you get the bottle and there's like, wait a minute, this, that, that was a bear. Now it, we see things, don't we? We notice things when it doesn't seem to be, help me, Holy Ghost, doesn't seem to be quite fair. And if you're not careful, it can put you in your feelings. Amen. It wasn't that they weren't getting it, it's that they felt they weren't getting enough of it. So there arose a murmuring. Amen. So, the twelve, who I believe, would, they're, they're speaking of the apostles here, that <clears throat> would include Matthias, who had been added in, in Judas's place. They had, had, had brought him, you remember that, from chapter 1. And so, the twelve called the multitude together. And I like that. Let, let's pause right there. Sometimes, you need to stop hearing this side and that side and just call everybody together. Amen. I, I'm kind of one that's like that. I, I, I've had to steer clear over the years. And I'm not just talking about pastoring, but there's just been times I said, I'm going to nip it in the bud. Let's call everybody. 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 Amen. <laughs> in and let's hear it all out. Yeah. Been, been at home. Amen. Left, Stephanie left me in charge with those three kids and they fighting and squabbling and arguing and fussing. I don't try to get one story here. One, Let's call them all together called a multitude. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So they called the multitude of the disciples unto them. Now keep in mind, their word for the apostles are the 12. The disciples are the Christians and the people that are, that are there. All right. And said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. All right. So what that means is that table serving is Possibly that the same word tables is the same word that's used uh, for tables when Jesus overturned the money changers tables. All right. It's possible that it could have been handling the finances, counting the money, distributing the food, having fellowship times and meeting and deciding who's going to provide for the Lord's Supper here. Deciding who's going to eat in this house over here. And as you move from house to house, it was organizational, managerial type things. And the apostles say, it is not reason. It is not one thing that we should prioritize this higher than what we've been called to do. That we should lead from what we're supposed to do to go serve tables. Does everybody catch that? All right. So this is really why Acts 6 is here. The apostles who had, who had Christ had ordained were sanctioned to do what? Deliver the word. To pray. To intercede. To deliver the word. To evangelize. 
What did he tell them? Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Those are Jesus' final marching orders. All right? So that, that is what they are supposed to do. But sometimes, as is the case, we in our lives can get things misprioritized or, or out of priority. We, we can get the cart before the horse. Praise God for wisdom for the disciples to notice, or the apostles to notice that we cannot leave from what is most important that we may serve tables. All right? Questions or comments on that? So they realized that it was not obedient or advantageous to get caught up in the daily service and routines of the congregants and all that was happening and that, that undercurrent that was happening. And so therefore they knew that their two important things was what is already in will, will be found in Acts 20 and 28. What, what is the job of the, and I know the pastor, we're going to look at pastor compared to apostle. There's kind of a, a parallel. We're seeing what they're saying here, but also you can see how it sets up for the organization of the church with the pastor. What is the primary, primary, uh, primary job of the pastor for a church? What is that? Teaching. Teaching. Amen. To preach, to teach. All right? If you go to Acts 20, 28, it will tell you. There's actually two things. If you got it, say amen. Acts 20, verse 28. Somebody want to read that? Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, all and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost has made has made you overseers to the church of God, which you have purchased with his own blood. Thank you. So first of all. The, the Apostle Paul here says to take heed to yourself. So the pastor must feed himself. Now when I say feed himself, that doesn't mean chicken, rice, and corn. and That's not what that's saying. He's got to eat from God's word first. What happens if you don't eat? You don't grow. You get weak. If you don't eat, you don't grow. You get weak. So you don't want a weak and sickly pastor who has not bothered to feed himself Amen. trying to feed you. Okay. Take heed to yourself and to the flock of God over which the Holy Spirit has made you pastor, has made you overseer, has made you bishop to feed the flock of God. Then it says over, over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. So your, the job of the pastor is to feed the flock of God. He feeds himself. He feeds the flock. All right? And so there's kind of a play on words, and there was a debate a few years ago uh, it, over something that was in a minute book uh, a long time ago, and it said uh, they thought it was a misprint, and they thought it should have said P-A-S-T-O-R, and it said P-A-S-T-U-R-E. It, it was from an older minute book. But that was perfectly correct because a pastor does pastor by pasturing. What does a shepherd do? He takes the sheep out to green pastures so they can feed. It is the pastor's job to lead the flock to where they can feed as he is led by the great shepherd, by the Holy Spirit who is the one who leads beside still waters and, and restores souls and leads you to green pastures and leads you through the valley of the shadow of death. You, all those various things, that is what the pastor is to do. He is to pastor by pasturing. That's pretty interesting. We, we don't want to be taken to brown brittle dried up pastures no. <laughs> come on if y'all sheep in here yeah. you, you, you don't want to think, let, let, let's make a parallel 
Come on, if we say, let's let's go now, let's go to eat. I, I, I'm, I know I'm right about it. Let, let's go eat. And, and I say, I've got the perfect place. And I take you all there. I can see some of y'all's faces now. If we took you somewhere where the food wasn't good, where there wasn't enough of it, and where it was cold and, and not very tasty, I could see you looking how you would look as you bit into it. I can see faces, yes. Say, go on, say amen. And this, and then, you know, and then we do this type of thing. So catch the parallel. Catch the parallel. The, 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 the shepherd, the, the under shepherd, uh, the pastor needs to take the flock to green pastures so that they can be fed. Amen. So we took that detour to let you know that what the apostles are saying here to all those disciples who are coming, they're saying it's not uh, uh, reasonable for us to leave what is important amen what is top priority so that we may just serve tables amen now the second thing not only is the word a priority but then you'll see in verse 4 that prayer is a priority of the pastor all right your success is dependent on the pastor praying and interceding for you amen i try to Go through the pews and visualize where people are as they sit there. I try to, as people pop up on Facebook, I took a wonderful cue from, uh, from uh, uh, the book, Draw the Circle. Took a wonderful cue. When somebody texts you, when you see their feed on Facebook, take a moment and pray for them. It's reminders of who you are and your faces. And as the Lord brings me names, even if I'm in the shower, even if I'm laying there trying to go to sleep, I try to say a prayer for you. That just that that simple intercession right there can be enough to sway the tide. Amen. It is it is our duty to pray. So the apostles are saying here, it is our duty priority number one. Not saying there are not other priorities underneath, but they are saying the top priority, which must receive the most amount of time is giving ourselves to the word of God and praying for you. Questions or comment? <clears throat> that word reasonable is, is means is, is not agreeable. All right? And that's true. They are saying it's not agreeable with the command of Christ that we reprioritize. Amen? So, and for the church today, what is the parallel to that? That is the main thing. What should be one of our key top components? It is being fed God's word and, and living off of God's word and, and eating God's word, feeding on God's word, and praying. Now, yes, there are other things, but it is it is the key component that leads to where we ended up last week. What did I, what did I say last week? Salvation of sinners. Amen. I'm going to keep digging at that. The problem is... <laughs> when we get our priorities wrong. Amen. Amen. When we get our priorities wrong and we become a, a choir-oriented church. Mm. Amen. I've known churches that, oh my goodness, when they ask you about the church, oh, that choir. That's first things mentioned. So that lets me know that Wow, they got a great choir. What about other stuff? What about their evangelism? <coughs> what about the preaching? What about their ministry? What about reaching the lost? For I don't know about that, but they, they can sing. <laughs> Catch this now. Some churches are great at uh, ministering to people's needs, and that's necessary. They are there. They are giving everything all the time. But then again, if that takes top priority over the word, then we have to be careful. The enemy is slick. In fact, you're looking at how slick he is. What is the number one priority of the church? Salvation of sinners. Amen. Salvation of the lost. How do we know this? Well, verse 3 says, Wherefore, brethren... Look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, wisdom, whom you may appoint over this business. So stop there. 
this lends to the fact that they are saying the church is an organism. In fact, it is the only living spiritual organism there is. All other things are organizations. And once again, if you don't prioritize, then your church can become an organization rather than an organ. Wait a minute, what are you talking about, Pastor? What are you talking about? Hear me out. If you don't prioritize right, then your church will become more of an organization than an organism. What does Hebrews say about what the word of God means to the believer? It says it is living. It says it is active. It says it is like a two-edged sword. So if God's word is living and active, but it, 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 it slides down the priority list, then what does that do to the living organism? It weakens it. So we must prioritize God's word at the top. Amen. The organism needed organization. So the characteristics of what the apostles put in place was here. Here's what they said. You need to look out since we can't leave what is priority for us and meet all the needs of these thousands of people. You need to look you out, look you out among you for seven men. Amen. Seven is a biblical number. It's a number of completion. Seven men. And what were the characteristics? Number one, don't overlook it. It said they were men. Amen. Okay? It said they were men. All right? Number two, it says they were of honest report. What does that mean? Huh? They have a good witness. They were of honest rapport. They had good character. All right. Number three, very important. They were what? Full of the Holy Ghost. And because I believe they were full of the Holy Ghost, that would help them to be full of wisdom. Amen. Can anybody in here say just on a regular level of... of uh, just just being honest with yourself if I did not follow the leading of the Lord I certainly wouldn't be considered too wise amen, amen. there's times well, come on church there, there's a way that seems right to man but in the end is death is destruction is that man's ways and his wisdom falls but when we follow the wisdom of God it never fails. Amen. Amen. So full of wisdom. Key. And then don't overlook this. You don't see it generally listed, but it says that we may appoint over the business. So the key was that these men, because of these characteristics, could be set in motion to be over the business of the church. All right. So verse three. This organism needed organization. As it grew, it became more organized. And God has put that in motion with something as simple as looking at life itself. First time I ever went to an ultrasound, uh, uh, Stephanie and I went. I didn't a bit more know what I was looking at than a man in the moon. Just look like a bunch of squiggly lines and pictures and stuff on it. And I'm, then, then finally the young lady said, now this is this. And there's the diaphragm and there's the heart and there's this. And I, I began to think about that. And then I had to teach some of that in science class. And it's amazing that one cell becomes two and two becomes four and four becomes eight. And they keep dividing to multiply. And as they divide to multiply, then they start to organize. Some cells turn into respiratory cells. Some cells begin to make the skin and the circulatory and the, and the, the digestive part until every single cell has a purpose and it's part of tissue and tissue becomes organ and organ comes organ systems and it becomes a living organism. God is organized. He's a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. Amen. So had they not organized, then that would have been chaotic. 
And as one writer said, if you want to see chaotic, look at the, the church in 1 Corinthians. They struggled. They had all kind of issues because of the foolishness that was happening. But in this, oh, this beginning church, they were organized and they began to recognize what needed to happen and put it into place. Amen. <clears throat> Verse 4 says the apostles were to give themselves to prayer continually <clears throat> and the ministry of the word. This means to do just service to their prayer life and to their study. And I could hear screaming, Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, study to show yourself approved. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't know how long that I will be here, how long uh, the Lord will allow that, but here's the key. If there ever is another pastor, when there is another pastor, make sure that person that comes is a studier of the word. Amen. Lord, help us. Not just to throw it together at the last minute. Amen. I'm going to say it. Not just somebody that says, I don't study. I don't study. I just stand up and let the Lord speak to me whatever he's going to say. And I know the scripture says that Jesus said to the disciples, don't worry about what you will say in that moment. I'll give you what to say. But then it also, that was for them and for that particular time. Yeah. It also said study to show yourself approved. Yeah. Yeah. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Amen. Discerning God's will for your life. You haven't thought about what God's will is for your life and how the word deals with you, preacher, first. Then how can you tell somebody else? Got to be careful of that. 1 Timothy 2.1 says the same thing. To study, to give prayer, to pray. So the man of God must devote himself to prayer and the word. And all they had, now keep in mind, they didn't have the whole New Testament like we have. They had the Old Testament. And they had been with, and they marked them, that they had been with Jesus. So uh, what an amazing thing. They had the Old Testament, and then they had what Jesus had said, and they were putting that together and declaring God's truth to the people, and people were being saved. Now, how do we know this was organized? Watch this. Look at verse 5 and 6. I've often overlooked this. I never noticed this. Verse 5 and 6. Now, we struggled over these words. Amen. I wanted to do a Lion King and call that Timon. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I, I guess it's Timon. But catch this. Watch this. Who was arguing with who? Go back to verse 1. Mm. Who was arguing with who? The Hellenistic who? So those were the Greek. Hellenistic is Greek. The Greek Jews were, were murmuring against the, the local Jews. It, it is note is noted that your writer, your your Bible may tell you in your study Bible that each one of these names are names of people that it is a Greek name. So catch that. Don't miss that. It's easy to miss it. And I did that they appointed people that could relate to the people that felt like they were being slighted. Say that again, please. They appointed people that had a Greek connection to the people who were Hellenistic and Greek okay. that were feeling like they had been slighted in the daily administration. Yeah. So what is the connection to us? There is a reason why you're here in the church. The things that you have gone through in life, your experiences and all that you are, God has brought you, he's bringing you, he is working in you and on you so that you may connect and relate to somebody that needs what you have in you. That's the beauty of the living organism. I've seen it on a, on a secular level. I know what it's like to not have a father in the home. I mean, I had a strong mother. She did well with me. She worked on me, worked on me back here and up here. Amen. 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 But having a man in the house, it, it was sometimes it was not having a man in the house was sometimes hard. So the Lord, even though that was hurtful at that time, allowed me to understand what it's like and, and go through some things. And there have been moments in my teaching career when I have been able to connect with a young man because they were going through the same thing. Amen. You look at it from the church, don't look at your experiences and things you've gone through 
as detriments and bad? Do you know God is able to work things for your good? And sometimes that good is that you may share and say, yes, I know what you've gone through. Yes, I know what you're going through. That's the beauty of church. That's why Hebrews 10, 25 says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves, but come together as, as some as is the manner of some is, but come together and, and encourage one another as even more as you see the day of the Lord Amen. approaching. Amen. So all these guys had Greek names, not Jewish. <laughs> they didn't send the folks that the folks was mad at to connect with them because that probably would have caused more strife. I wish I could dig a little further into that. Yeah. Lord help us. Amen. They, they sent folks that could connect. That's why you pray for your pastor to when things arise, when murmurings happen, that we put the right people, do the right things, say the right things, put them in place so that healing can occur. Mm -hmm. Now, it is of note that when they say this in Verse 5, that they point out that Stephen, and this is for next week, but watch this, Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. That kind of, even though it's with the seven, it sets him apart in some rites. All right, this is where he has officially mentioned the name. <clears throat> now, that word full means, back to the, the, the verse 3 as well, full of the Holy Ghost means to be fully saturated. And every surface is covered. What an interesting play on how that's worded. <clears throat> fully saturated. <clears throat> fully saturated. That reminded me of John 14, 30. Y'all have heard me use this verse before. Circle it. It's not emboldened, but circle it. Do you all remember this verse? Go, go find it if you can. You go back one book. Fully saturated. John 14, 30. So it says Stephen was a man full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith. Verse 3, it says that these men were supposed to be full of the Holy Ghost. That word full means saturated. And every surface of their spiritual life is covered. So how does that connect to John 14, 30? What did Jesus say? Wait a minute, what did he say? Anybody want to read that? <clears throat> Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me. Amen. All right, so watch this. Is it hot in here or is it just me? It's hot in here. It's warm, okay. Watch this. Jesus is saying, I know the devil is going to come after me right but he doesn't have anything in me he can grab hold of you'll catch that that he might use to his advantage that's what Christ said now we are supposed to be Christ like and strive to be like him so when it said that these men were to be full of the Holy Spirit that means they are full fully saturated to the point that they are filled and it is overflowing, and all the outer surfaces, spiritually, are covered. And I thought about that. Wow. So that the enemy cannot get a hold of them. There's nothing in them. And that's, that's, the, that's the point that I think the writer wants to make here, is that if you're going to be full of the Holy Spirit, that will help you. If you, if you are, that will help you in your battle against the enemy. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, things are moving quickly, and this showed that there was a formal appointment of these men when they laid their hands on these men. Now, I've had people that kind of say, you know, want to argue about the fact that, well, the first deacons, uh, so to speak, these seven men that they pulled out, um, they just laid their hands on them and sent them on. Well, they had to. Because things was happening quick, right? And some of us in here might be sitting and, and wondering why why they put us through the ringer. I know two in here should at least be saying that. Amen. Amen. 68 questions? Are you kidding me? 
I'm talking about when they put you up before the council, make you go through all that strenuous question. And the first one Reverend Armstrong asked me was, did you get any sleep last night? Here I do that answer. <laughs> no, I didn't get any sleep. Yeah. Amen. He was just trying to calm me down. But we go through the catechizing process. And, and then after they pray and lay their hands. But <clears throat> today, that's what we do. But then it was quick. It was quick. Amen. They, they, they had to move. And they laid their hands on him. Now, catch this. That is a sign that also that laying on of hands is a sign that now you're linked to this ministry. Mm -hmm. And with you being linked, keep in mind, in, in Acts 4.18, they'd already been threatened. The apostles were already threatened. Don't you teach anymore in Jesus' name. Don't you preach anymore in Jesus' name. Don't you come in the temple and preach and teach in Jesus' name. Now they're laying hands on folks, hands that had been in jail, hands that were emboldened now because the Lord had shook that place when they prayed for boldness. They're laying hands on these seven men, and they are linking them to this ministry. Those seven men must know now that we are linked, we could go to jail. We could lose our lives. We could go to prison. But it is for the gospel. Amen. So church co-labor means one who is willing to share in the glory and the sufferings. <clears throat> Do I have time to deal with that tonight? Amen. I said I'd get you out of here early. I don't know. But we, we can. That, that's the difference in some churches sharing in the glory. When things are great. Right. When it looks good from the outside. Everybody's whoo, there. But when stuff gets rocky and folks start to murmur and, and stumble and, and, and things are, are sad and, and things need healing and, and there is suffering and hard times come. Jesus said it this way. If, if you are wanting to identify yourself with me after their big debate, who's going to sit on your right hand? Who's going to sit on your left hand? He said, I'm only passing out cups of baptism into death and suffering. He said, but if you understand what will happen on this side, then you will be most joy over what will happen before my father on the other side. But on this side, you may suffer a little bit. So if you're going to identify with me and you want to reign with me up there, you got to go through what I'm going through now. And see, a lot of people, they, when the times get rough in, in, in church and times get rough in life, they, they don't want to lay their hands on that. Amen. 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 Catch that. Catch Amen. that. So co-labor means one who is willing to share in the glory and the suffering. Amen. 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 I won't ask y'all tonight again as I've asked you multiple times, but if there ever comes a time, <laughs> who's going to say, yeah, he laid his hands on me. <laughs> And pray for me. I'm with him. I'm with him. I'm with him. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus died for me. Yeah. He, 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 he is my savior. I'm, I'm with him. He, he's touched me. I'm, I'm with him. Amen. 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 So verse seven, the result of organization is not numbers, so to speak, but it says that the word of God increased. See that in verse seven. Mm -hmm. Then after the word of God increased, then the numbers Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Now, don't miss this. I have missed this before. Watch this. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. That kind of lets us know that some of the priests who were part of those religious leaders, they started to see that there was something that, that was changed. In fact, one writer said they may have began to see that when they noticed that the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. That began to change their perspective. It was not a man to God thing, but it was a God to man thing. And some priests began to notice, wait a minute, this guy just died and there were bodies up walking around and, and then he rose again from the dead and these men are boldly preaching. We're telling them to shut up. And they're preaching, anyhow, something's changed. And a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Amen. Some of those who had persecuted began to convert. <clears throat> so 
Don't be so quick sometimes to cast doubt on somebody. They'll never get saved. They did this to me. You know what? Sometimes the person that's hurt you the most is the one you need to go straight to and witness to. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's why Jesus, praise God, on the cross of Calvary said, Father, forgive them. He didn't start just pointing a few folks out and said, Father, forgive them, but forget them. He said, Father, forgive them. Even the ones that had laughed at him, spit on him, mocked him, ridiculed him, pulled out his beard, blindfolded him. Father, forgive them. Sanctioned his death, so they thought. Father, forgive them. Now, the extra points are for you. If you will, before you leave here, before we finish, turn to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and the 11th verse. This connects with this text. <clears throat> Two things I want to pull out of this, and then I, I promise you we're done. So if you have Ephesians, the fourth chapter, <clears throat> that looks uh, familiar to you, say amen. amen. I do believe this is the verse, or was the verse, that was hanging down at Mount Olive during the association. It's one of their focus verses, <clears throat> and it's been a verse that we have certainly dealt with here. And it says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. That verse right there shows us that there is organization. Some different people have different jobs, different for different dispensations as well. All right. <clears throat> but verse 12 is what I want you to focus in on. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So what those two verses tell us is that the apostles, amen, those who were the pastors of the early church, they were given so that they may effectively pasture and pastor the sheep to go out and make more sheep. Amen. So if you connect the dots, here it is. We cannot go away from, <clears throat> reprioritize what the Lord has told us to do. Feed ourselves so that we may feed the flock and give ourselves to prayer. Because if we do that, it destroys the model of what the Lord has put in place. That once you hear the word of God, it should grow you up so that you become an evangelist. You become a witness. You become, uh, 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 Acts 1 and 8, a witness to those who are close to you and beyond. That you win others to Christ. Get that? For the perfecting, the growing of the saints. For what? The work of the ministry. Amen. So, with that being said, that brings perfect clarity, in my opinion, to what they were trying to do in Acts the 6th chapter. You see it clearly in what Paul says to the established church in Ephesus. Now, if you have kept track all the way up through Acts 6, notice what did they experience? Go down to number 6 on extra points. They experienced outside opposition, correct? What happened? Outside opposition. The religious leaders said, stop teaching and preaching. Then they experienced sin in the church. Y'all got that? A week or two ago, Ananias and Sapphira. They were deceptive and they were uh, they had they were hypocrites. And now, here's the one. Underline this. Dissension from picky people. Alright? Let, let's let's pray over this last line all together. Read it as I read it, you, you pray about it. Dissension in the body of Christ <clears throat> is nothing new. Disunity and infighting can destroy the energy of a church. 
These would include petty pride, discontent. Y'all are still underlining, ain't you? Jealousy, bickering, personal preference, power struggles, and that will drain a church's strength. So as one writer said, he would rather face outside persecution <laughs> and even have to handle inside sin rather than deal with the stuff that can happen, the fallout that can happen from disunity with picky, peculiar people. Y'all like peas? There they are. Dissension will drain the sap out of a church. Y'all hear me tonight? Amen. I'm not trying to close, not trying to, to shut it down. I'm just telling you dissension, disunity will drain the life out of a church. So one more time, let's not let that happen here. <clears throat> will everybody always treat you right? No, but give it to God. Amen. Will everybody always speak to you right? No, but give it to God. Will everybody always talk about the pastor in loving words like they do on pastor's anniversary? Amen. I didn't get to this lesson before pastor's anniversary. I love y'all. No. Have folks talked about me? Sure enough, they have. But I gave it to God. I don't do this for people. I do it for him. I have to prioritize. He is number one, and then people, and then the, the folks under those people. It is God, family, church. You have to understand that. So we have to prioritize right. Amen. If you get tore up about everything somebody says to you, you never get too far. Amen. Give it to God. Pray. And as the Lord leads, we work through this thing together. I, that's why pray for wisdom and discernment. Sometimes you've got to walk away, close your mouth. Amen. And don't be so quick when folks are at the altar to wonder why they're there. Maybe they praying that they don't say something to you. Hello, somebody. Amen. They up here again. That ain't none of your business. That's between them and God. Amen. And maybe you should be up there. Come on, unity, church. You should be up there with them. That's the type of church. Because I'm going to say this real fast. Nothing will bring you quickly, more quickly together than when persecution comes. Disunity will tear you apart quick, but persecution from the outside will bring you together real fast. Amen. Pray about all of it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Questions or comments tonight? I, this, uh, going back to verse 3 there, it says, whom we have appointed over this business. In uh, Acts 3, uh, 6, 3. Could that be where some people kind of want to say that the church is a business? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. That, that scripture can be misconstrued. <clears throat> I don't have the uh, <clears throat> I don't have the meaning of that word down business, but if you get on your Bible study tools app and go to interlinear Bible and look it up and see what the original meaning of it, of it is, it might give you some insight. But I, I, as I put in your handout, the business was probably administering the Lord's Supper. Who was going to baptize? Who was going to be in the house? To teach him from house to house. Feeding. Uh, meeting the widow's needs. Meeting the, 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 uh, the orphan's needs. Who was going to handle the organizational things so that the apostles could focus their time on praying and studying God's word. Now, <clears throat> we haven't gotten to this yet, but this will be a point of, of reference eventually, I, I believe, in, in Acts. When you look at it, that there is a, a way that the New Testament church is set up. Uh, you hear elders and, and various ones, different. That, that's a, 
another word for deacon, but the only two, the only two uh, New Testament offices in the church are the pastors and, or the pastor and the deacons. All right, now, some churches have sub-pastors that they call elders, and then underneath of them are deacons, and that would be no different than me saying, okay, we have here a pastor, and then we have associate ministers, okay, and then we have deacons, but the two ordained offices of the church are pastor and deacon, and as you see from the text, deacons are here to serve the church. Now, I've had people ask me, what about trustees? Trustees are not appointed or ordained by what the, Bible's, what, what the Bible says. In fact, yet they are supposed to be, uh, it is state required that they have trustees to handle the business. That is a state law. Now that goes back to one more time, showing that uh, we obey God and we obey man's law as it is in reference to, to what God's word says. All right, but yet with that, with a trustee, the church gives them their business to handle. So even that has an organizational flow according to scripture. Questions on that? Amen. All right. So organized, brother. We're organized. We're an organized organism. Amen. And we thank God for everybody. And then not to steal what Dr. King says, whether you are the one that made the door or you should open the door for somebody else, whether you are the top of the line, the king in the palace, or a street sweeper, you, you have a job. Amen. 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 I think you get to that in 1 Corinthians. Every part of the body is needed. I think we dealt with that when we first came here. Yep. Unity in the body of Christ. Amen. Eyeballs acting like they're supposed to act. Feet acting like yeah. we talked about navels and nose hair. Yeah. Every part. Remember y'all remember that? Pinky toes. Every part serves a purpose. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you all for coming tonight. We ask that you continue to pray for those who are down, those who are in need, those who are sick, those who are uh, in bereavement, those who are depressed a lot of people are going through a lot of things a lot of things and there needs to be people around them supporting them and praying for them amen, amen. father we come before you tonight in jesus name and we thank you for this opportunity to pray and give you glory and, and thank you for the, the top word this evening help that it'll find a lodging place in our hearts that we will grow <clears throat> that we will be strengthened that we will reach others for you. Help us to carry out the fulfillment, fu fulfilling uh, of, of uh, Acts 1-8, that we minister and give the gospel and help it to spread um, from close to, to far away, if it be your will, whatever you choose for us to do. And we want to give you the glory. And we know that one day all, all evangelizing, all church coming, and all preaching and singing will be done. And you will bring your church home be with you forever. We thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Now bless these as they go and give them traveling grace to their appointed destination. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you all.